And the Lord gave me this message. It just flooded out of heaven very quickly this week in Jesus' name. So I know it came right from him. And it's named Experiencing God, the Evolution of Gratitude. Experiencing Jesus, the Evolution of Gratitude. You know, some of the most prideful and arrogant people that I've ever known are the poorest people that I've ever known in the, in the phys physically poorest. <laughs> I think that probably, although I've been prideful, uh, sadly prideful almost all my life, some of the most prideful days was when I was sleeping in my truck, didn't have no place to live. <laughs> Such a genius. Instead of becoming humble in those moments, I became more and more prideful, thinking that the whole world had something wrong with them and not me. Bill Mitchell reminded me of something that Brother Stan said many times here from this pulpit in this area. And, and he said, there's going to come a time and that there's going to be a day when you better know that your next meal and the only hope for your next meal is to come directly from God. Amen. There is coming a time in this world where you don't not got, where we're not going to have nothing in the fridge. Right. We're not going to know where it's coming from. But we're going to be dependent upon God for it. But right now, we're not dependent upon God for anything. We're dependent upon our bank account and our job and somebody else, okay? And we thank God casually for the blessing, but we're not dependent upon him. When we become dependent upon him, when we go like Joy Nelson, I'm going to move to, to Burundi, Africa, okay? And I, I'm going to give away, not sell, give away everything I own. And I don't know where I'm going to work, what I'm going to do. Then we take a great step in becoming that way. Maybe we're not going to become that way physically today, but can we start to become that way emotionally? Okay. The evolution of gratitude. I want to show you how it's going to work in Jesus' name from heaven. And I pray that you receive it. But see, no person can motivate another person in this area. I might say something that makes you feel guilty for a minute, which is not my intent in any way about how you feel and how you've been living your life. And you might start to feel a little bit of gratitude for a minute. But the Holy Spirit wants to motivate and shift us into people whose identity is, is of gratitude. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I'll tell you one thing that hit me. All through, when I finally came to my senses like the prodigal son and I came to Jesus. I was 45 years old and went through prison and all of those things. And then I came out of prison. And uh, it was a great time of humility, and, and I was broken, and I wanted to continue to stay broken. But, and I got out, and I wanted to get my family back together, my kids, my, my, my Ashley and Hunter, and I, I wanted to be with them. And, and uh, so I started to go to church at Irving Bible Church with my son Hunter. And it was around Thanksgiving time. And... <clears throat> They had these sheets where you could sign up and every family could make a, a, get a laundry basket and fill it up with stuff uh, for, a, for a Thanksgiving meal. You could go to the store and you'd buy corn and peas and stuff like that. And, and I think they provided the turkey, but they had a list of stuff you're supposed to get, right? And so I didn't have any money and I was sleeping on the, some people's floors and I had done a little bit of work I guess and got a little bit of money and I was able to take my son Hunter and we went to the store and we started buying stuff and I was only able to buy you know the, the, the kind of the least expensive stuff of all the all this stuff and I didn't, wasn't able to buy a real big basket I just got a basket I filled it up as good as I could. And I remember feeling like I was able to give something back. Me and Hunter, and we took it in. And they had this gym that was full of these baskets. They must had a thousand baskets in there. And these baskets had big balloons and flowers on them. And they were twice as big as my basket. And they were heaped up with food. I got this little baby basket. Me and Hunter did. That's all we had to give. Oh, it hurt me so much. Because I realized that these other families were going to get these. 
sell their big baskets. And they'll never count my baskets. I don't think I was this little thing. And it did something to me. It did something to me. I'll never forget it. I don't even know what it was, but there's this just gratitude of seeing the difference between real gregarious giving and my little basket. I don't want to be a little basket guy no more. If God gives me anything, I want to give it away. Amen. And he has given it to me, and I am giving it away. Yes, you are. And so are you. So are you. But there was a shift in me. You know, through prison, I had a little bit of money in prison, and I was able to bless guys. But something happened when I got out of there. And then I got to thinking this week, Jeff, I guess God knew that someday we'd get to feed a lot of people together. Yes. Amen. And he Amen. took that little basket. Right. I guess kind of like he took those five fish, those little loaves. Amen. He just he's made 100,000 Jesus burgers now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else it'll be. I don't know what else it'll be. But it started, I think, a big part of it about this shift into this place of experiencing Jesus and gratitude, of having an identity of gratitude in that, in that time. And I just want to share from my heart today what you showed me. I can't motivate you to do this or to, to, to have this shift. But I'm going to show you what the Lord showed me and, and how he wanted me to talk to you about this today. In Jesus' name, if you were to, if you were to have a, a scale right here, and <clears throat> I call this childhood development, Christian childhood development right here. I've, I'm going I'm to take you through two scales, and you're going to fit on this scale somewhere along the way. And this was your Christian life. And I was to say, okay, this is the first step in the Christian life. This is the wah-wah stage. This is the baby stage. This is the pacifier stage. Now, don't get mad at people that, were, that, are, that are Christian babies because we all had to be a baby before we could get to be a man, okay? This is a very important part. And some people leave the baby stage of being a Christian and go right back into the, the, the man stage of the world. You see, in order for you to become a, a Christian baby, you have to leave the manhood, prideful stage of the world in brokenness and contriteness to become the baby. The first step is a, a step of brokenness. And, and then maybe you get to be a little bit older and you're kind of a kid. I want you to think about your life. If you're just starting out in the Christian life, or maybe you've been in the Christian life a long time, but you still want your own all you think about is yourself. All you think about is your emotions. All of your sentences start with me and my and my family and I. Here's your pacifier. Some of us are children now and we're learning to share. Probably because the backs of our hands are all red from Kelsey beating on the back of our hands saying, you better share with your brother Jackson. But we start to learn to share just a little bit when we were in the early childhood. Some of us are teenagers. Ooh, that's the secret stage. That's when you get to be like almost a professional Christian. where Because you can act all this way and then you can burn off, okay? You're a, you're a teenager. You're too cool for school, okay? Some of you might be right there. Let me, let me start again. Where are you? Are you in the YY stage over here? Don't give yourself too much credit if you are. Just be real. I'm all about me. I need my needs met, okay? I need mama to meet my needs. I need that preacher. Oh, that preacher better come over. He better, he doesn't love me. <laughs> or we're in the early childhood. The early childhood, we just want, we're in the Christian community just for what we can get out of it. I can get a friend. I can put a Bible verse on social media and somebody say they like me. We're a teenager. Oh, now we learn the lingo. Now we're cooling out. Okay. But then maybe we get into early adulthood. Where we got our eye on somebody that might be our, our, our wife or our husband, right? And we're starting to say, okay, I, I'm starting to build something here. I'm starting to be a family here and I can see in the future a little bit. Maybe this is you. 
you're starting to see yourself as a family builder, as a Christ family builder, as a kingdom family builder, okay? You may not know what it looks like, but you've at least left the secretive stage of the teenager uh, that's too cool for school, okay? And now you've come into this and say, okay, I, I believe I want to plant here, Rudy. I believe this is what I want to do, okay? I've seen that. I'm not a baby anymore. I've learned some lessons along the way. I, I want to do this, J.L., okay? But now the next step is the, is the parent stage. Think about the evolution between the baby and the parent. Think about your evolution in the physical between becoming a baby and being a parent. The same evolution is true in our spiritual maturity, in our development from, from childhood. Now, when we become a parent, who matters more? Me or, or them? There's a great shift, isn't there? How about we, when we become a pawpaw? If I had dentures, I'd give them to you so you can have a birthday present. Do you see what I'm talking about? So I've asked you to put yourself on this scale. I'm not going to make you come up here and stand up here. Okay. All right. But you know, the Lord is showing you. Do you desire to be a parent or a pawpaw? Or are you just content with being a teenager and keeping your little secrets? Still all about me, me, me. Here's your pacifier. Okay. I don't know where you are, but God knows where you are. There are people that could, that are stuck in this teenage thing because they are all about their own giftings and their own stuff. And they think that, uh, they don't understand that God gave them anything that he gave them for the body, for somebody else. And they're really not quite parents yet because they're scared of the responsibility that they could take. Now I'm really talking to a lot of y'all right here. Okay that could step into this parental place and say, I can pastor, I can shepherd people, but I'd still got my own selfish things and I've own selfish need. And I believe that there's many stuck in between these two places. Can't quite see yourself out of this teenage place into this place of becoming the, the young, the young, the young couple that is starting to, to starting to see stuff. And I don't mean you have to have a partner. That just means you're starting to understand that you can take this next step someday to parent people. Some of us think that we can just parent our biological families. Read the Bible, man. Who is your mom? Who is your dad? Those that love me. That's what Jesus said. Who's my brother? Who's my sister? You see, God wants us to begin to think like that. Not just here at Treasure, y'all, either. Treasure is just a mechanism. A, it's, a, it's, 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 it's the church, but we are kingdom builders in Jesus' name. You have people that you influence in your life that I'll never meet. Fantastic. Parent them in Jesus' name. Get to that place where you can do that. All right. So let's look at some scripture. Let's go to Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32. Very familiar scripture. I'm going to approach it from a place I don't believe you've ever heard before, though. Remember when we've been talking about experiencing Jesus these last six weeks, I've talked to you about three ways that Jesus can, uh, t talks to us in those gospels, in the gospels. He talks to us sometimes in teachings. Most of the time they're called parables. He talks to us in direct confrontations. And then he trains us. All of these three ways, these are the primary ways that he talks to us. So today we're going to be talking about a parable and a confrontation. And we all know the story of the prodigal son, but I'm going to take you through this in such a way that you're going to see the development of the prodigal son. You're going to see when there's some shifting in his life. And, and candidly, you know the story so much that it has got no impact on most of you. But right now, this can't impact your brain. This has to be that place where you're in that gym with me and you see all of the other Thanksgiving baskets and all of the beautiful things that are going to go to feed other people and you got nothing to give. The reason God promoted me is because he broke my heart first because he knew that then I would have other opportunities to give. Amen. That became the motivator in Jesus' name. Or you can just stay with your little basket. You don't have to. So if we make the evolution with the prodigal son today in Jesus' name, to leave all the childhood things behind, if we can make this with him today, and then the next story I'm going to tell you also, if we can make that transition, all of a sudden we can move from that side of the scale toward this side of the scale in Jesus' name. 
And we can own this position of parenting in a whole new way in Jesus' name. And then I'm, that there's going to be something deeper than all of this for those of you that are already papas. Okay? God has given me something for you as well in Jesus' name. There's something for all of us today. Don't take for granted that you're over there yet, though. Let's read this. I'm going to read this real quick. Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. He said to them, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them, the father said, the younger of them inappropriately said to his father, Father, give me. Somebody say, give me. Give me, give me the share of property that falls to me. Okay. What's the baby say? Give me. What's the child say? Give me. What's the teenager say? Give me. Teenager says, give me more. Yeah. <laughs> Don't he, Chris McCleaver? Yeah. Give me the keys. Okay. So he divided the estate between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered everything he had, and he traveled to a distant country. He wasted his fortune on immoral and reckless living. When he had spent everything, somebody say everything, a severe famine occurred in the country. See, God brings the famine. He, did, he wanted this guy to be broken. Okay? He wanted to get him in a place, Rudy, where there was nothing left of him so that he could finally hear from him. Not only was he broke, now there's a famine in the country. Now I can't even eat. And he began to do without, and he began to be in need. So when he went and he forced himself on one of the citizens, in other words, the guy turned into a super beggar dude, okay, and, and began to beg this guy, please, can I feed your pigs? Please, can I go in the field? He would have gladly eaten the pods that the pigs were eating, but they could not satisfy our hunger. No one was giving anything to him. I want to talk to you very seriously right now. How many of you have rescued somebody that was in the pig pen? I want to tell you something. Nobody has rescued anybody that's in the pig pen. God has rescued somebody that's in the pig pen. And until you're in the pig pen, you can't be rescued. You see, many people, out of compassion of our heart, try to just enable people like comforting them and letting them continue to do their thing. We know somebody's on dope, but I'm going to keep bringing them food so they can spend their food stamp money to go buy their dope. You are enabling people to, and you're never letting them get to the pig pen in the distant country when there's no food and they got nothing in their pocket. No matter how compassionate we are, we're not more compassionate than Jesus. And if Jesus does this, we're going to do it too and we're not going to apologize for it. There's nobody that loves more than you do, treasure, in Jesus' name. But sometimes the way to love is by using the word N-O, no. And there, from there, the life comes from that place in Jesus' name. I'm going to take you to another place about this in just a second when we get through this other story. So you begin to understand this better. If you want to be a parent and you want to be a pawpaw, you can get there in Jesus' name. I want to come back to this end of the scale just a little bit and completely have compassion on, on the guys right here. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so very glad you're here. Okay. This, this is a, this is a, it's a journey. It's not a, like a, I don't have a slingshot that we're going to get launched. Okay. My journey is, you know, as if I'm 15 years into it now, 14 years into it now. And it was, there were some tough times in there, but I had to say, I didn't want this place anymore. Right. I had to say, okay, I see the pacifier. I can't do this anyway anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move from diapers to pull-ups at least, okay? <laughs> and, and I'll begin to make this evolution, you know. And you can make this evolution in Jesus' name, okay? There's more in you than you think, but we we've got these security blankets literally sucking on our thumb and got a security blanket that is holding us back that will never fit at the next place or the next place, okay? It could be a thousand things, but let's just say we are going to have courage to release them right now in Jesus' name. The old hurtful things that our moms and dads said, the things that we were trapped in, the false identities. Okay, now we're moving this way in Jesus' name. The prodigal had a, a, a place where he was terribly entitled, wasn't he? That's what holds us back from being broken and contrite and hope, having gratitude. It's pride. Straight up pride is what holds us back from gratitude. Because we think I can get it and I can give it my way. 
I've got this under control. I don't care how old you are, how much money you got, you're a baby. You are right here. If you're telling stories all about you, you are stuck right here. You'd be saved for 40 years and be stuck right here in Jesus' name. Lord God, I ask you that this would land right here. That it would land right now in Jesus' name. See, the prodigal story is not just about the sinful rebellion in this guy or his own, or his own uh, decision to just live in recklessness. It, it's about the pride in him that can happen to every single one of us at every single place. And it can try to rise back up, can it? And spiritual pride can be part of that. Well, I know more than that, preacher. <laughs> Can't believe you didn't know that Bible verse. Here's your slot right here. All right, here we go. Verse 17. But when he finally came to his senses, this is the boy. And he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food while I'm dying out here of hunger? His need produced humility. God uses our physical need to produce humility in us so that we can be in a contrite place to listen. We can run away from that or we can embrace it. As ministers, we can, we can be like David and just play the harp for Saul and his demons. Or we can say, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm going to let you get to this broken place. And when you're broken physically and spiritually and ready for Jesus, I'll be there. You can count on me in Jesus' name. But I'm not going to quit feeding the dragon. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to feed the dragon no more. Verse 18, I'll get up, says the prodigal, and I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, this was his strategy. He still had some game. This was his hustle. I know what I'll do. <laughs> I'll just go hustle my dad. I'll tell him that I'm not willing to be a son. He'll probably feel sorry for me. Probably give him some more money. He'll get up and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer to be worthy. Just treat me like one of your hired men. Another version, though, in verse 19 says, make me like one of your hired men. See, at the first of the story, the prodigal son is a baby. He says, give me what's mine already. I'm entitled to it. But at the end of the story, toward the end of the story, he begins to say, make me, make me a servant. And we believe that something happened on this journey, I believe, as he was going home. Where did he have to go? He was a far away from home. He had to go back past all the people that had ripped him off. And he had to start owning it. He had to own every one of those relationships with all those people that have hurt him. And all the things that had happened to him. And all the things that he had been mad about and hurt about and all of these kind of things. And then he had to release it. So that as he got closer to home, he could receive his sonship from his father. There was value in every step of his journey getting home. And the value was bringing him to this contrite place to be grateful that he had a home in Jesus' name. There's no greater gift given by anybody than that, G that Jesus would come, but that God would give his son Jesus. The gift is God himself, the father, Abba, the creator of everything, to give us Jesus and I can tell you to be grateful about all those kind of things. But until you experience Jesus, would you like to experience Jesus coming off of that cross, coming as a special, precious virgin baby to you, to your house, and then his bloody death? I can't make you grateful for those things. And that's just the physical part, not to mention the spiritual part and all the ramifications of all the sin of mankind falling upon him and separating him from his dad. We're responsible for that. And if we wake up every morning to be grateful for that, or we are entitled to it, I'm entitled to the cross. I'll just go sin some more. I, great, I got grace. I'll sing amazing grace. Here's your, here's your ticket to hell, and here's your pacifier. You're not going anywhere. And it's not my words that will change you, but God's conviction from heaven right now, in Jesus' name. May it come upon all of us. Now I want to ask you another question. Same scale. Here is the, this is like a one to 10. Here's this part of the scale. Here's the takers. Most of my life I'm interested in taking. I'm interested in making money for myself so I can get money, so I can buy stuff, so I can 
make myself feel good. My conversation is about me. I want to tell all the stories about me and my family or my past or even good stuff that's happened to me. I'm just a taker. I want to get people's attention. There's, there's a zero right here. But here's a giver. He, he don't talk about himself at all. He doesn't care about himself. He, he don't care where he shops at, where, where, where he makes anything. He, he talks about Jesus all the time. Amen. That's his conversation. All he wants to do is love somebody else. God, just give me an opportunity to love somebody else today in Jesus' name. I'm not drowning my tears on, in anything. If you want to move toward that parent stage, it's all about becoming a giver and not a taker. But nobody can motivate you to do that either. You see, a lot of Christianity, uh, modern day Christianity, is, is, is about prosperity. Which flies in the face of the upside down gospel that we talked about last week, doesn't it? It's not about giving. It's about getting. Many times. Getting a blessing. Praying for a blessing. Only reason that I would want a blessing is so that I could pour out the blessing. And that someday there would be crowns at my daddy's feet in Jesus' name. And I know that so many of you are living that way in Jesus' name. So there's your other scale. Look at your life. Look at this week. What's your conversation been about? What has your thought life been about? Has it about, about, been about me? Woe is me? How bad my circumstances are? All my problems I got? Okay. Well, we're, we're on the end of the scale, aren't we? And as we have the maturity, Cheryl, to release things to the Lord and to trust him, then it becomes about Jesus. I don't know how Jesus is going to heal me through this thing, but I know he's going to. And I trust that it's done already in Jesus' name. I've been a little bit of a baby sometimes saying, these people did this to me or I can't believe this happened to me and letting it get in my attitude sometimes. Forgive me, Lord. I was a baby. I don't want to be a baby. I want to see things from the, when Jesus said, it is finished, son, in Jesus' name. Just trust me, son. Just do what I say. I got this thing. It is finished in Jesus' name. One more story. Luke chapter 19. Stay in the book of Luke. By the way, I would like everybody to read the Gospels. Are y'all reading the Gospels? I pray you're reading the Gospels. The more you read the Gospels, the more you're going to be able to associate with what I'm talking about. I want everybody to have read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John through chapter 15. Everybody read through chapter 15 this week. Catch up. If you haven't read, just read a book. You can read a book a day, no problem. Okay? Read through chapter 15. So we'll all be working together on these Gospels. In Jesus' name. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 19. The fruit of gratitude brings the action of salvation. You need to write that down. You got your notes right there. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. The fruit of gratitude brings the action of salvation. Another familiar story. I pray that you hear it from a different place today. Jesus entered Jericho. Now, Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's, the triumphal entry is in the latter part of this chapter when he goes into uh, Jerusalem for the last time. But he's in Jericho right now, Frank. I got to thinking about, well, why, did, why was he in Jericho? How did that work out? That's not really that close to Jerusalem. You know, he's got a long way north to go from there. But, but Jericho was the very first city that the children of Israel conquered. Joshua brought the children of Israel across the Jordan River and into Jericho. It was like the first land that they began to conquer right there, right, right there. And now he's headed to Jerusalem to do the last and the finished business in Jesus' name. Something significant about that part of the journey. God is letting us see that the, that the promised land and all the promises of God have come true and come to fruition right there in Jesus' name. Luke 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho. And was passing through. And there was a man called Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He was a superintendent. Others reported to him and he was rich. Zach Zacchaeus was trying. Somebody say trying. To see who Jesus was. But he couldn't see. Because of the crowd. For he was short in stature. So he ran ahead of the crowd. And climbed up in a sycamore tree. So he could see him. And he was about to pass that way. See something in Zacchaeus was awesome right here. Okay. He must not have liked his life. I believe that he was likely an entitled individual, but I believe that he was entitled because he was in pain. There's a place that God is going to move you. I'm going to, I'm going to finish talking about this a little bit, but then I'll, I want to talk about the difference between the renewed mind and the mind of Christ. 
But we start to think about Zacchaeus and say, what motivated Zacchaeus to do this? First of all, why was he a tax collector? What, what was it that made him be so, uh, such a greedy person? Did he struggle with his identity because he didn't look like anybody else, everybody else? Did he have parents that were really rough on him? Was there an expectation on him? And then he was driven into bitterness so that he thought that the answer for his bitterness was just to have more and more. Or was he trying to set such, such a low self-esteem and insecurity that he thought if he had more possessions that he would be happier? Those are all traveling those are all part of our journey and part of the tricks of the devil, aren't they? All different kind of ways that, that the devil would try to t trick us into being that place. Whatever brought Zacchaeus to this place, I pray that we're here today, where we make a strategy to see Jesus. He had to do a deal, didn't he? He had to figure out how to run around, what tree to get in, where Jesus was going to walk. He had to make a strategy. That, that's an effort. He, couldn't, he didn't casually just stroll up accidentally. Zacchaeus made an effort to go see Jesus. I pray right now we're making an effort to go see him. I'm praying that we're making a strategy to do that. Yes, Jesus came by, but he had to do something too, didn't he? All right, here we go. So Zacchaeus hurried and came down. Oh, hang on, hang on. So he ran ahead of the crowd, climbed up in the sycamore tree. He wanted to see him. He was about to pass that way. When Jesus reached that place, verse 5, when Jesus reached that place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today. I must stay at your house. Okay. So what I want you to understand right now, we're talking about experiencing Jesus. Somebody say experiencing Jesus. Look at your friend, look at your wife, look at your neighbor, look at the person you're with and say, say this, I want to experience Jesus with you. I want to experience Jesus in our house. I want to experience Jesus in our life. I want to experience Jesus at your birthday party, Armac. Whenever Jesus began, he, Missy, all that had to happen was Zacchaeus come into his presence. Jesus did not preach a big sermon or teach him a lesson or anything like that. He just said, I'm going to your house. Now, if Jesus said, I'm coming to your house, I know what y'all women would think. Oops, got to mop them floors. <laughs> Some of y'all would think, ooh, what, 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 what movies have I saved on TV? I got to get rid of them. <laughs> Conviction falling through the house right now. <laughs> Jesus wanted to go to Zacchaeus' house. He wanted to get in his business. You know why? Because he loved him. Are you bold enough and courageous enough to make a plan to be with Jesus and then to let him come into your house, into who you really are, into your, your, your mess? Zacchaeus was, okay? Zacchaeus was ready for him to come in there. He didn't make any excuses. He said, okay. So he came down from the tree, hurried down, and he welcomed Jesus with joy. And when people saw it, they began muttering and discontent. I don't even want to talk about these knuckleheads. He has gone to be the guest of a man with a notorious sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, see, Lord, I'm now giving, somebody say giving, half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll give back four times as much. Jesus came to his house. He didn't give any kind of speech. The conviction of Jesus fell upon him. That's what I pray right now. If we're going to experience Jesus, it's not about what we're learning in our head. It's about how God is changing our hearts and moving our spirits right now that we would experience it. If there's anything unholy in your house, what is it? You want to stay over there as a baby? Keep your sin. Keep your secret, teenagers. Okay, fine. You can stay over here. There'll be no fruit in your life. You'll never be Psalm 1, 3 tree, planted by the river of water, yielding fruit in his season. Nope, you're over here. You're practically a dead little sapling. 65-year-old teenager. Hey, hey, keep, fa keep failing ninth grade. What can I say? Hadn't passed your driving test yet. Zacchaeus didn't want to be that, okay? He was willing to expose himself to Jesus and let Jesus change him. And then immediately there was an action. Has there been action in your life? From your salvation, action in your life from your freedom, action in your life from healing. If the answer is no, 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 or maybe, 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 here's your pacifier. There will be action in your life when something really happens. The, the kingdom of God is about power and not a lot of talk. It's about transformation, not conformation to the world, but transformation in Jesus' name. Is that happening in your life? 
I pray that it is. Are you a, still a taker or are you a giver? Are you so emotionally needy and wrapped up in yourself and your yesterday that you're just a sponge and just looking for this false compassion of the world? You can get it from Jesus right now, just like Zacchaeus. Whatever identity problem and identity crisis that he had that made him want to be so greedy immediately changed right there. In that moment, I don't want to be this guy anymore in Jesus' name. I want to experience Jesus for the rest of my life. I trust him. He don't even have to say anything. I feel the difference. I got conviction on me. If I came to your house, not me, but I came in there and the Lord was with me, of course. What would be going on with you? What we need to look at, what we need to talk about. Would there be already holiness or would there be such hurt in your heart that conviction would start to say, Brother Allen, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something I hadn't told the people in 10 years. I got this problem. They're really hurtful. Today can be that day, but you don't need Brother Allen. You need Jesus. We need to experience Jesus today, okay? To say, you know what? I want this off of me. I don't want to be this baby anymore. I understand that this has held me back. And I don't want to be that person anymore in Jesus' name. I'm willing to confront it. What is driving me to this sin that I haven't stopped that's separating me from God in my misery and staying me and keeping me in this place? What is it? Today, God wants to just take you like Zacchaeus and immediately come to your house. Jesus, come to your house today. He coming to your house today, okay? And in that convicting place, we're going to leave that so that we can receive what he's got. That's my prayer for you in Jesus' name, that there'll be a great shifting going on. You see, if we're really saved, then there will be an action that follows it. Real gratitude, real giving means that their heart has shifted. We cannot be manipulated by our mind, y'all. Our heart must be broken and it must be contrite to bring conviction and to bring change. Love doesn't demand its own anymore. If we're not loving and giving freely and demanding our own, we're we're a teenager. We're we're, we're straddling the fence between uh, wanting to become this person. But we really, we still have these selfishness inside of us. God wants you to say, okay, trust me. Okay, I need you to be a parent. Do you want to build my kingdom? I need you to be parental. I need you to shepherd the heart of the person beside me. Okay, now here's what I got for those of you that may be on that end of the scale but may be a little bit stuck. Lord God, I ask you to show us right now in Jesus' name how you can take us to another place. Be not conformed by, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, renewed mind is wonderful to have a renewed mind. Here's the renewed mind. Here's what it looks like. I don't think about the world anymore. The world doesn't have power over me. Jesus has power over me. I think about Jesus things. I, I, I want my life to look like Jesus. Okay. I want to do the things that he, he wants me to do. I want to feel and, and, and interact with him all the time in Jesus name. That's the renewed mind. That is beautiful, but that's not the end of the story. The renewed mind means I don't have the old mind. I've got a new mind and I'm doing the right thing and I'm living for Jesus, okay? It's a, it's a great thing. It's a, it's a huge step. Matter of fact, if you don't have a renewed mind, you don't have salvation. You don't have transformation. You don't have a renewed mind. You don't have salvation. But then, how about this? Have the mind of Christ. What's the difference between the renewed mind and the mind of Christ? That means that now you're the guy that sees, that sees Zacchaeus in the tree and looks at him. And knows, even before he says, says anything, knows what he needs to help him to change him. Amen. Now I've got the mind of Christ. Yes. I may need to say something. I may not even need to say anything. Maybe my presence, like God's presence, will be like Peter and John that changes people around him in Jesus' name. Maybe the conviction will fall upon them and they'll be broken and contrite from the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Or maybe I'll be able to see in such a way into their hurt and into their pain and into their journey. Because Jesus knew exactly why Zacchaeus had become a bitter and greedy guy. Alone and selfish. He knew why he was there. If you want to have the mind of Christ and move just from having a renewed mind, which is awesome by the way. But move into a place where you have the mind of Christ. That means you see people as Christ would see them. For the purpose of ministering to them and helping them in Jesus name, not judging them, not talking about them, 
not saying something to them so that you can be noticed or that you can get a pat on the back, but so that God would take them and bring healing to them in Jesus name, bring salvation. Many times I'm with people that just start lecturing and we're out on the missionary trail and they're just lecturing and they're telling them to quit smoking cigarettes or whatever it might be. That's not the mind of Christ. Where is your hurt? What is going on with you? But I may not even need to ask, but the God may just show you exactly what it is. But even if you have to ask, but then you begin to shepherd that person. Well, now you've got the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. So that God would bring healing in that way in Jesus' name. This is the last story I'm going to tell you. Joe, why don't you come on up this way if you don't mind. Now, if you've got the mind of Christ, guess what? You're the pawpaw. You're not just the parent, you're the pawpaw. Seeing what the whole family needs in Jesus' name. Many of you are on that trail. But what do you got to leave behind to get there? What are you compromising with in your life in the flesh? Who's your soul tied to still that's holding you back from becoming these trees on this end? What religious practices or jargon have you been tied to before that's got you stuck in this way? Where you, or, or are you scared to, to, to really operate in the spirit and scared to trust the Holy Spirit beyond what you see? It's okay, man. Look, it's okay. Do you want some of it, though, in Jesus' name? It's okay. This is an evolution that God wants us to take us to. This is kingdom builders getting to that place. But do you see the evolution of gratitude? Without gratitude, without understanding God's great sacrifice to give his son. You know, Sonia just told me something so beautiful. Sonia, we're with you in every way, sweet sister. She just told me something so beautiful and so selfless and selfless. And she said, you know what? God just wants me to be thankful for the years I had with Chris and not regretful of the ones I don't have. Is that, is that, is that a selfless person or what right there? Because, you know, that's what Jesus, that's what God did when he said, Jesus, I'm grateful for the years I had with you, son. And in some ways, Sonia, you've gotten to experience what God saw when he lost his son for a moment too. In Jesus' name, we're so sorry we're walking with you. But God has trusted you with something that is so beautiful and so deep and so painful at the same time, which is exactly what he went through. In Jesus' name, we love you with all of our heart. We're going to be there for you. We're going to be there for you. Last story. Well, it was Thanksgiving. I started to think about the Thanksgiving meal. How many of y'all are still on a little bit of a, a, a tryptophan coma? <laughs> Somebody said tryptophan isn't even real. Oh, it's real to me. I'm out of there. Boy. <laughs> By the way, tryptophan is supposedly this chemical that's in the turkey that just makes you go sideways and start snoring about half, about three bites in. It happens to me. <laughs> But I started thinking about the Thanksgiving meal and what it what it looks like, you know. Um, you got the you got the cranberry sauce, boy. You gotta have some of that, you know. You gotta have some special uh, fluffy salad, some fruit over there. Some of y'all mess up and get some green pea salad. I don't know about all of that. And then we got the turkey, you know, different ways of cooking it. Old old Bobby Crenshaw, he's a master at frying them turkeys. We got different kind of ways to do it. But let me tell you what the Thanksgiving meal, the rock star of the Thanksgiving meal is the dressing. See, the dressing is where all the creativity comes in. It's where all the style comes in. It's where all the... i got to have a word here. Abracadabra, supercalifragic, expialidocious comes in. That just came to me. I have said that in 40 years. <laughs> That's where the dressing comes in right there, okay? And, and, and it's cool, right? So, so who, who's the dressing maker? Who's the dressing maker? Is the dressing maker the, the baby? Or the kiddo? He would make his dressing out of M&Ms, by the way, if he was making a dressing. Is it the teenager? No, they got the chips. They got the chips going on. Is it the youngin? Young family? No, because they got they chasing around, okay? Grandma makes the dressing. Think about the evolution of the dressing maker. I really want to get right down in your business right now. I do. The Lord wants to come to your house right now, just like Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. 
so that you can begin to see, I can become the dressing maker. Let me tell you about the dressing maker, my mom back there. <laughs> She's a good dressing maker. <laughs> See, once you start to make the dressing, you make it the first couple of times. People talk about it. They say how good it is. It's awesome. And they can't wait for it the next Thanksgiving. But then after a few years, they don't even tell you thank you for making the dressing no more. Because they take you for granted. But you know what my mom does? She just keeps making the dressing. She just keeps making it because she knows they're going to love it. She don't make it for her. She makes it for us. She just keeps making the dressing. You don't want to make me dressing makers? Just start making it for somebody else. But that ain't the end of what the dressing maker does. Pretty soon, when somebody gets to be about 50 years old, the real dressing maker starts to train the junior dressing maker how to make the dressing. Now you got to be 50 before you can even be a junior dressing maker. <laughs> and the, the recipe, let me tell you the recipe is. It's right here. It ain't on no little piece of, it ain't on no little piece of paper. We got a pinch of this and a pinch of that. Behind the back pass over there. A little extra sage over there. Secret ingredient that you don't get to, you don't even get the secret ingredient until you get the baton and pass to you, okay? That's true. That is true. Guess who the new dress maker is now? Sydney's the new dress maker. Because Mamma trained her to be the dressing maker. And she can be the dressing maker now. And she's going to raise up dressing makers behind her too. And what we see in the flesh about the dressing maker can be your place in the spirit. The way you can live. You can stay as the child over there. Or you can have an aspiration of being the dressing maker. And you know what? It won't be too long before they forget Cindy's dressing either. And they'll just know, hey, she just makes the dressing. That's just what she does. And you know what she guys going to do? She's just going to keep making the dressing. She's going to keep passing out the hugs. So to all of y'all special dressing makers who nobody loves you and nobody gives you a hug and tells you thank you anymore, the Lord sees that dressing. He knows why you made it in Jesus' name. And your blessing is coming from Almighty God. Stand up together with me in Jesus' name.